right, welcome everybody. Um, this is our youth activism workshop, which is part of our How Do We Get Here series. So thank you all so much for taking time out of your day to join us. As part of our long tradition of working actively towards racial equity and our commitment to improving and diversifying the historical perspective, we are proud to present to you this youth activism workshop as part of our How Do We Get Here conversations about race, anti-Blackness, and identity series. Many people have referred to the current climate as the summer of awakening, and in many ways, this entire series is designed to awaken and provoke you to see history in a different light. As the Missouri Historical Society, it is our job to provide historical perspectives on timely issues and cross historic, economic, and racial divides in order to tell the story of everyone who calls the St. Louis region home. I want to first applaud each of you for participating in this discussion. Tonight's presentation may feel uncomfortable in times, but it's important to create space where dialogue and deep discussion may happen. We acknowledge that each of you have different vantage points based on your lived experience, but please use this time to listen to different perspectives or people and gain knowledge. Um, it is our job to bring uh, proactive voices to the forefront or passionate voices to the forefront. And with that said, we are going to get started. So. Some uh, logistics. Uh. This is a webinar based program. So that means that right as of right now, um, we can't see or hear any of you. So don't, you're not on camera. And if you wanna respond, um, we will be asking lots of questions, answer them into the chat. So the fact that this is webinar based means you can just send it to us, the panelists, and we'll read them out loud and keep your responses anonymous. This, um, and embrace the chaos. So actually, I don't think we're going to be having a meeting style conversation for parents after this. It's just going to be us today, but we'll check in on that later. And then um, embrace the chaos. So this is brand new for all of us. And granted, we've had more than a few months to learn Zoom, but things still go wrong. Things still happen. And that's totally okay. We're here for it. We're going to embrace the chaos and do our best. Oh, no. So brave space rules listen to others. So we're not actually talking to each other today, but we will be chatting. We will be listening to people presenting. So be sure to listen with an open mind. Be kind and respectful. Ask questions. Like I said, please utilize the chat to message the panelists and we will respond to questions. So ask as many as you want. Um, I wanna make sure everyone gets a chance to participate. So please um, make space for our voices to be heard. Please share. Um, and we wanna hear everyone's voice today. And use I statements, we're just gonna speak from our own perspective. So today we will be defining terms, learn about what an activist is and what actions they take, learn about intersectionality, and think about issues you care about and how you can advocate for them. Now, I am not here alone. I am he joined um, here with several of my colleagues. I'm going to step back now and let them introduce themselves and we'll get started. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Carla. Hi, everyone. My name is Ellie. Hi, everybody. Hello. My name is Victoria. Hi, guys. And my name is Alyssa. And I'm actually going to get us started today. So I'm going to get us started by determining, sorry, <laughs> defining some terms. Um, and our first term is rights. But before I define rights, I want to ask you, what do you think of when thinking about rights? Like, What comes to your mind when you think about the word rights? And we're going to give you a little bit of time to answer this, and you can type your answers into the chat. And we will read it out for you. Don't have to worry about that. Okay, so we do have an answer. So someone says they think of people. 
when they think about rights, they think about people, maybe rights for people, education, okay? So rights to um, have a right to an education. That's a really good one. We'll give just a little more time for anyone who might want to answer. Okay, we have an answer, voting. So you have the right to vote. Anyone over the age of 18, right? Or age 18 and up has the right to vote. That's a good one. Just about 20 more seconds, 10 more seconds. You have some good answers though, voting, education, thinking about people and what this means to people. All right, so we're gonna move on and define rights. So rights are the freedom to be allowed to do or to have certain things. And I see some of the answers we got into uh, our chat here. So the right to vote, the right to an education and right to freedom of speech are some examples of rights. So let's define another term, discrimination. So discrimination is treating one person or group of people less fairly than others. So if we have the rights to do things like vote into an education and to freedom of speech, and someone denies that right, then that is considered discrimination, whether it's against one person or an entire group of people. Okay, so let's move on. So now we're gonna answer two questions and we're gonna ask these individually and give you time to answer them individually. And just like last time, type your answer into the chat, okay? So the first question is, when is a time you've seen or learn about a person or a group being treated unfairly compared to other people? And again, we'll give you just a little bit of time to answer that. And this could be something that you witness in person, or it could be something that you might have saw in a documentary or on the news. A time you saw someone or a group of people being discriminated against, being treated unfairly, being denied some type of right, like the right to vote. Okay? So someone saw, um, something like this as a type of discrimination when they were at school. Yeah, that happens all the time, right? Sometimes at school. School segregation. That's a very good example of discrimination, absolutely. People are made to go to a certain school or deny the, the right to go to a school of their choosing because of maybe how they look or what religion they practice. It could be anything, right? But they should be able to go to whatever school they like. Okay, and almost done. All right, so time is up on that one. Let's move on to the next question, okay? When is a time you or someone around you has stood up for themselves or others when they were being treated unfairly? So this one is one you're gonna think about on your own life, your own experiences. A time when you or someone around you has had to stand up for themselves because they were being bullied or discriminated against, treated unfairly. And again, I'm just giving you guys time to chat, to answer your, you know, in the chat.
That one is kind of a hard question to answer there. Okay, so someone discriminated, was discriminated against or maybe saw someone being discriminated against and had to stand up for themselves at summer camp. Again, so that's kind of like school, right? So summer camps, a lot of different people gathering together, but sometimes people get treated unfairly, unfortunately, right? And maybe that person uh, stood up for themselves by telling someone about it or telling other people that this is what's going on. Just a few more seconds on that question. All right, so we're gonna move on. Okay, so when I think about standing up for someone or myself uh, against some, you know, someone who's denying rights, right, or being treated unfairly, I think about protests. So protest is a way that people can stand up to people, places, or things that are denying them their rights. Okay. So we're going to look at some historical examples that took place in St. Louis in which people protested. Um, in the name of their rights. So this first photo is a protest that took place outside of Jefferson Bank. And so this protest was against job discrimination. And so the protest was against unequal, unequal hiring practices um, by the bank. Um, it was officially called Jefferson Bank and Trust Company. And they were simply just denying or refusing to hire African-American people at that bank. And so we see here in this picture, they have their signs and they're marching around the building. Sometimes they would stand there with their signs or maybe sit outside the property. And this protest lasted for seven months in 1963 and it's considered one of the longest protests in St. Louis history. Let's look at something else. Okay, so we have a protest against segregation in this photo. So we see here some ladies, they are members of the Citizens of Civil, sorry, Citizen Civil Rights Committee, and they are participating in St. Louis' first counter sit-in, lunch counter sit-in, on May 15, 1944. So a lunch counter sit-in was protesting um, a drugstore's refusal to serve African American. So um, a lot of drugstores during the 1940s and 50s and on into the early 60s um, kind of like Walgreens or CVS, they had lunch counters on the inside, like a little tiny diner, and African-American customers were allowed to come in and shop, but they were not allowed to sit at this counter and be served food. So this is not only the first lunch counter sitting uh, in St. Louis, but one of the first in the entire country. Okay, we have another example here by the LGBTQ plus community. And this is actually the first Pride Parade in St. Louis um, on April 20th, 1980. Uh, however, the parade was coordinated by Dignity St. Louis in response to some of the discrimination that the LGB, LGBTQ plus community was uh, facing at that time, including discrimination in the workplace and the denial um, of rights to be married legally, married legally. And so they marched from the main campus of uh, Washington University on into Central West End. So those are some examples of protests throughout time. And I'm gonna pass it over to my friend Ellie at this time. Uh, and she's gonna tell you more about the people who decide to participate in protests. So. Go for it, Ellie. Thank you, Alyssa. Um, hey guys, we're gonna talk about activists. I'm sure you guys have heard the word before, but if not, I've got a definition for you. Activists are people who take action. Now remember, action is a verb. People who take action to make a change in society for what they think is the greater good for everyone. 
Uh, I can name you guys a few examples. Um, what about Martin Luther King Jr.? He was an activist. Uh, Rosa Parks, I know you guys know her story. Remember, she wouldn't give up her seat on the bus. And how about uh, Ruby Bridges? Remember, she was a little girl that integrated an all white school. Those were activists. Now let's move on a little bit. There are many different actions activists can take. So I'm just gonna name a few. Uh, there are so many more out there, but let's talk about a few of the ones that I'm thinking about. Some actions that activists take. Um, stay strong. You see the little guy over there in the little lavender looking shirt with his arms up? Stay strong. Now, I don't necessarily mean doing push-ups or swimming laps around a pool. How about another action? Tell someone in charge. You see in the little card there, there's a judge and there seems to be like a teacher. How about share your story and educate others? That's how we learned about Martin Luther King. That's how we learned about Rosa Parks. That's how we learn about a lot of famous people and their stories. How about be a helper? You could help someone to read. You can open the door for someone who has challenging issues. You could help around the house. How about confront unfair rules? Now, I don't know what's going on here, but she is saying, stop it. I don't know if he said something or was doing something, but she's confronting unfair rules. Now, I know I went through those a little fast, but we're gonna get an opportunity to look at them individually. Stay strong. And that means speaking up for yourself and others, not giving up when things are slow. Now, if you look at that picture, look like they're protesting or, or having some type of memorial service. Now, changes don't come overnight. So sometimes things are gonna be slow, but we have to stay strong through the process. How about tell someone in charge? You could call someone. Maybe you can write a letter to a politician. In this picture, we have the former first lady. This is Mrs. Hillary Clinton. Maybe that school decided to write her a letter that she could come visit. Or maybe they wanted her to take some actions in their school. They're telling someone in charge. How about share your story and educate others? That's how we learned about Martin Luther King. That's how we learned about Rosa Parks. That's how we learn a lot. We have to share our stories. We have to post it on social media, if you like, or you can do some creating some art. Now I'm looking at this picture here. Um, look like we've got a painter up in the right hand corner. He's creating some art. But this one picture is a picture of the arch. And in the center of it, it says Black Lives Matter. And I know on the far right end, it is, I believe it's Percy Green. You'll hear more about him a little later. But they're sharing their story and they are educating others. So there's different ways that you can get your word out there. You don't necessarily have to march with a sign. You don't have to march with candles. You don't have to march. There's so many actions that you can take. Let's look at this one, be a helper. Now in this picture, I'm looking at like a group of people, right? Um, maybe it's an organization, maybe it's a community and maybe they wanna be a helper. You can have a lemonade stand or other events to raise money to donate to a cause. There are so many different ways that you can approach this. How about confront unfair rules? Remember she said, stop it, protesting in the streets. Now I'm looking at this sign that this guy is holding and it says, without justice, there will be no peace. He's confronting unfair rules. He's seeing something that's not fair and he wants to get out there and he wants to protest. So guys, now you're gonna have a chance to participate. We're gonna do an activity. I hope you guys are ready. You guys are going to look at um, some historic St. Louis examples of activism. 
As you're looking at these images, I want you to think about what is going on and what actions they are taking. Remember those actions we talked about, staying strong, share your story, be a helper, confront unfair rules. But this time, you guys, you're gonna use a poll to decide what actions they took. Now, there may be several, uh, so I want you to check as many. All right, let's look at our first image. Here we have adults and students protesting school segregation. This probably was something that Ruby Bridges did. You see the little fella in the front, look like the sign is bigger than him. But he's protesting. He's saying, don't treat our children like prisoners. And in the background, the adults are in the back. He's in the front. Their signs are saying school segregation. And that's probably the same type of protest that Ruby Bridges went through. Now, as you look at this image, what actions are these activists taking? Remember, you're going to respond in the poll. We don't have a poll today, so just go ahead and type into the chat. Yeah, that'd be great, guys. What actions are these activists taking? And Sarah, if you don't mind, I can't see the chat, but if you get any responses, would you let me know? Someone said, stay strong. Staying strong, exactly. You know, I bet this wasn't their very first day out here. They've probably been coming out here day after day, week after week. But remember when I said sometimes change is slow? This is probably one of those, one of those problems right here. Someone else said uh, front unfair rules. Front unfair rules, that's right. You can put it on a sign and you can hold that sign up high and everybody knows what rule you are fighting for. And in this case, they're fighting for school segregation. Thank you, guys. Let's I, also see, oh. I also see one last one, which is sharing your story. Sharing their story. That's right. That's what we're doing right now. I don't know if you guys have ever seen this picture, but now that you have, you can share the same story, how you saw a little kid with a big sign fighting for school segregation. Thank you so much. Oh, and said, be okay. strong. Be strong. We have to, right? You can't give up. You know, that's just like a scientist. If a scientist doesn't get an experiment right the first time, he doesn't give up. So if there's something you truly believe in, guys, you got to stay strong through the process. We're going to move on to our next one. All right, can you guys see this image here? Now, I see on the far left, a picture of two African-Americans. Look at their facial expressions. They don't look too happy to me. One is holding a sign that says, we matter. And the other one is holding a peace sign. Now you look at the other picture, in big red letters, I see, still we rise. And I see two African-American arms coming up out of the ground or behind a hill, but they're releasing white doves into the beautiful sun, beautiful sky. This was happening during the Ferguson's uh, unrest. There were many businesses that had boarded up their windows, but there were artists and citizens who came together to paint these boards with inspirational murals. So I've described the pictures, I've told you what I felt. What actions are these activists taking? Now remember I said you don't have to protest. You can express yourself through art. What actions are these activists taking? If you can think of anything, please put it in the chat for me. Someone said, stay strong. Stay strong, right? We saw those people out there protesting, that little kid with that sign, he's protesting, he's staying strong. And then this person here, maybe they didn't want to protest. Maybe they didn't want to march, 
but they can still express their feelings. And they did it through beautiful art. Okay, guys, are we ready? Let's move to our next image. I don't have a picture, oh, yes I do, of Lucy Ann Delaney. Now, her story is kind of long, but I'm gonna just kind of make it a little short for you. Lucy Ann Delaney, just imagine, a 12-year-old girl, she's enslaved. Her enslaver is having her to do the laundry. Now, remember, Lucy's only 12. And she, Lucy said, you know, I don't know how to do the laundry when she messed it up. Well, her enslaver got angry with Lucy. And she said, you know what? Just for that, I'm going to sell you down the river. Well, Wolf, Lucy was afraid, right? So Lucy's mom heard about all of this, and she was trying to get Lucy free. Because by right, Lucy should have been a free citizen. Well, while they were deciding what they were going to do with Lucy in the court case, they put Lucy in jail. Now, remember, she's only 12. They put her in jail, and she was in jail for a year and a half. I bet she was scared. I bet she was frightened. But you know what? There is a happy ending, because in the end, Lucy did get her freedom, and she was no longer an enslaved individual. Now you heard her story, you see her picture. What actions did these activists take? What actions did she take? Come on guys, what did she do? Remember, it's a verb. What actions did Lucy take? Was she strong? Hmm. Did she share her story? Did she confront unfair rules? I see someone <laughs> put into the chat. She was strong. She was strong. At 12 years old? Excuse me, can you imagine? She had to be strong, right? Great. All right, guys, we're gonna look at this other one. Now we did talk a little bit about Ferguson uh, and their unrest. During Ferguson and the other moments of activism, people will often gather to meet and learn different skills to help, such as medical care, legal rights, and more. Now I'm looking at this picture. It's pretty diverse, right? There, I mean, everybody's not black, everybody's not white. We've got a mixture of people here, a mixture of people from the community. And from what I see, it looks like they're looking at some type of plan or a diagram. Maybe they're coming together to share their story to make the community better. Even a clergy is there. You see the guy right here in the front? We've got a clergy there. We've got a group of diverse people wanting to share their stories and help each other. So what actions are these activists taking? Remember, put it in the chat for me. What do you think? Do you think they're confronting unfair rules by looking at this new plan to, you know, maybe they can make some revisions, get things up and going, bring the community together? What do you think? What was that one where that guy was opening the door for the little guy that was in the wheelchair? He was being a what? What do you guys, do you remember? What was he being? He was being a helper, right? And we all can help each other. Guys, you all were awesome. I thank you so much for your participation. You know, we have learned a lot about activists and the different actions they take. 
But let's look deeper at the issues they are advocating for, how issues and identities are connected. And my friend Victoria is going to take you deeper. Thanks, guys. Hello, friends. Thank you, Miss Ellie. So we have learned a lot of things today, right? We talked about um, discrimination. We talked about how activists advocate for things that they believe in. So now we're going to talk about a word that might be new to you, but this word is intersectionality. It's a long word, but I bet you know part of the word. Let's look at it, intersection. You might, may have heard this word maybe in math class where you have one line and then you have another line that crosses it. It intersects the other line. Or you may have heard the word intersection, which is if you have one street and another street, it's where they cross. And this is where we see all of our stop signs, our stop lights, you know, all of that kind of thing. So intersectionality is looking at all of these different identities we have. They can be things like your age, it can be your gender, um, what religion you practice, it can be race or ethnicity. We look at all of those different identities that make us up and make me me, and it makes you you. We look at all of these different things kind of like a puzzle piece. You know, when you put all the pieces of the puzzle together, in the end, you end up with a very beautiful picture. And that's kind of what our picture here is showing on the right side of the screen, um, how all of these different identities make us up. And as we kind of talked about a little bit before, when we think about discrimination, um, we are looking at the ways that the different identities we have um, affect how we might be treated. Um, our friend Alyssa kind of told us about how you might be discriminated based on race or ethnicity, or it could be um, discrimination based on your religion. So that is what intersectionality is. It's saying that if I have these certain identities, people might treat me differently or they might treat me poorly because of that. So when we look at this picture here on the top, we have an umbrella, right? Probably like you may have needed today because it's a rainy day to day. <laughs> but you know, this umbrella, underneath the umbrella falls all of these different categories, right? We see safe neighborhoods and access to housing, equity and education, disability and healthcare rights. We see the freedom to be yourself, you know, to um, to acknowledge all of your identity. We see equal treatment for all genders. And at the bottom corner, we see environmental justice. So I have another um, term for you all, and that is the built, B-U-I-L-T, environment. So the built environment is a little bit different than, you know, the regular environment, like the picture shows. Um, the built environment looks at buildings. See, it's kind of similar to the word buildings. And it looks at these places where people go to school in, where they work, and where they live. So that is environmental justice. It is um, an issue that people advocate for when they want better housing opportunities and, you know, better and safer neighborhoods and structures for them to work and live in. So under this umbrella of Black Lives Matter, these are a lot of, not all of the issues, but a lot of the different issues that people are advocating for. So we are going to take a look at some activists that were really active in St. Louis in the past and have helped shape St. Louis um, and also different laws nationwide. So the first woman we're going to look at is Victoria Clay Haley. Um, and she was active in about 100 years ago. She was an activist, a teacher, and a leader. 
and she was an activist for women's rights, in particular, black women's rights. Um, she wanted them to be able to vote in the US because before 1920, no woman could vote in the United States. Um, and she was a leader in many different organizations and she had many different leadership roles. She also in St. Louis edited this African-American newspaper that was published in St. Louis. And she just created a safe space for um, the black community and black women to um, advocate for themselves. Um, so thinking a little bit about um, Ms. Haley, what are some of the issues or what are some of the intersectional um, ideas we see from her advocating, her advocacy? You all can um, respond in the chat box. I'll give you all about a minute. Mm hmm I see women's rights. Great. Voting rights. Right. We talked about that in the beginning when you all thought of what are rights, right? <laughs> right. Um, yeah, rights for black women. Yeah. So that was kind of some of her intersecting identities, right? She was black and she was a woman. Um, and so she used her advocating skills to help, um, help advocate for women like her in St. Louis. Okay, so let's take a look at our next activist. I tried to do these um, to order our activists in chronological order. Um, so uh, Ms. Haley was very active a little over 100 years ago. So um, it's 2020. A lot of her work was done in 1910, 1920s, that type of era. So Frankie Freeman, um, was an activist and a lawyer, and she fought against St. Louis housing discrimination, unfair hiring practices at Jefferson Bank that we talked about a little earlier, um, and also unfair education in St. Louis. She started her own law firm in St. Louis, and she worked with the NAACP to help advocate for civil rights um, liberties for African Americans. Um, and eventually she worked with the US federal government, so she was working in the White House, to help people um, who came to her with civil rights complaints. Um, so basically these were things like after people were, you know, all people were allowed to vote by law, there's still sometimes when um, people of certain ethnicities, sometimes black people are barred they aren't allowed to vote um, one way or another. So they would take these complaints to her and she would work on resolving the issue and helping them fix the issue. And so she not only helped St. Louis through this um, and by being a lawyer, but she helped the US um, overall. So thinking about some of her work that she did um, what would you all say or some of the issues that she fought for, that she believed in, um, and those intersecting issues? So you all can put that in the chat box again. I'll give you all about a minute. Let me know what you're thinking. And she was a lawyer for 50 years. That is a really long time. And I think that's pretty cool. She helped people for a very, very long time. So I see housing rights. Yeah, definitely. I also see equal access to neighborhoods. Yeah, that was one of the terms under our umbrella. Do you remember? It was safe neighborhoods and equal access to housing. Yeah, she advocated for education and fair education. 
um, you know, desegregated education. Yes, and she also advocated for fair jobs, um, just like we talked about a little earlier with our Jefferson Bank protests. You all are doing great. Yeah, so Frankie Freeman was definitely a huge force in St. Louis and across the U.S. And she really helped change people's lives through her work as a lawyer and an advocate. Okay, so let's look at our last activist. So this is a picture of Ivory Perry. Um, and he was really active um, around like the 1970s, 1960s, 1970s. So around that time, which really wasn't that long ago. It was only about, you know, 50 years ago. So Ivory Perry worked in St. Louis to, and he worked with uh, predominantly African American communities um, who were living in um, certain certain areas of the city because that's where they were pretty much allowed to live in. So he worked with um, African Americans in these communities and people living in these communities to make sure that their built environment, you all remember, so the places that they lived in were safe. Um, and so he would go in and speak to the people who live there and kind of make sure, um, you know, like the faucets are working, that nothing's dangerous to their health. Um, but while he did this, he actually made a really huge discovery. And it was a really important discovery. So he found that a lot of these houses actually had a very, very dangerous type of paint in them, which was lead paint. L-E-A-D. So lead paint um, is actually very, very dangerous to young children, um, even to adults, but especially for young children who are growing up. And um, so with, with the lead being in the paint, you know, over time, you kind of inhale the, the paint fumes and the lead gets into your system. And so that can be very dangerous. So he used his skills to organize and advocate in March. He had all of these skills to be an activist that we kind of talked about earlier, right? And he, he got the city to pass a law on lead paint in homes in 1970, which was very, very important because a lot of the people who had lead paint in their homes, they were usually lower income, or um, people of color. So it was very important for their children and for their communities that this law was passed. He also advocated for fair housing overall and fair job treatment, as well as fair treatment from the police. From the police. Um, so this was also kind of in the 1960s. So it was really only 60 years ago um, but we still see, you know, a lot of the issues that he fought for in St. Louis are still, um, there's still issues today that we still have to advocate and fight for. Um, but he really did make a big difference in St. Louis and making, you know, our homes and places that we live safer in St. Louis. So I would say that some of the issues he looked at were housing rights, you know, um, housing discrimination, as well as environmental justice. You remember that picture of the globe of the earth in someone's hand? So environmental justice, he looked at that built environment, you know, all the buildings we live in, go to school in. Um, and he also, um, another issue that he looked at was police brutality. So we just learned about some really cool activists who really helped shape St. Louis um, and the people who live in it. And they advocated for um, basically fair treatment for the people, um, predominantly African Americans who live in St. Louis. So I want you all to think about which activists you would like to learn more about. 
and you know, can do a quick Google search and learn more. Um, here at the museum, we have a great exhibit on Ivory Perry. So if you want to learn more about him, you can come on by. <laughs> so um, we've learned a lot about different activists and the actions that they have taken and the issues that they care about. So um, I want you all to also think about some issues that you care about. What is important in your community or in your neighborhood or in the world? Something that you want to help solve. Um, we're going to give you some tools and resources next uh, from my friend Carla. And yeah, just remember you're never too young and you're never too old to be an activist. So we're going to guide you all through a project next. All right. Thank you, Victoria. Um, like she said, um, we're going to do an activity in a few minutes, but first we're going to think about some uh, questions. Um, and like Victoria said, what, what are some things that you really care about? She gave us some really great examples, but now I want to know what is something that you really care about. It could be one of the ones that Victoria discussed, um, but it might be something different. So think about that and you can type your answers in the chat. We'll give you about a minute or so to do that. And you can think about things that are maybe from your in your school or maybe in your community, your neighborhood, or maybe things that are affecting the whole world. Something that you see is unfair and you might want to change. Oh, I see one answer here, a fair government. Yeah, somebody is saying that they, they feel that having a fair government would be very important. And I agree. <laughs> what else? Equity in education. Yeah. Some, some neighborhoods don't have the books that other schools have in other neighborhoods. So yeah, everyone needs to have the same um, foundation for education. I think that's very important. And the, this, the same supplies, Got about 30 more seconds. Anything else that you might want to change? All right, well, let's go on to the next question. So if you do have something that you care about, how can you be an activist for this issue? What is something that you personally could do? I know Ellie talked about some actions that people can take in some examples she shared with us. Um, what is something that you could do? Type it in the chat. We'll give you a couple minutes or a minute and a half. And and think about maybe if you have a special talent that you could share or you can utilize as a way to, um, to speak out about something that's unfair. What could you do? Racism, so that would be an issue. Yeah, so what could you do to speak out about racism? You know, we've learned about some ways different people can protest. That might be something. Um, we saw some boards that were painted. People were using their art to get a message out. What are some other things that you could do? In about 30 seconds. You could share your story through a poem. Yes, thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah, you could write a poem, you could write a story, you could even write a play, and maybe get some friends together and act it out. Those are great ideas. Okay, all right, so now we're gonna move on and we're gonna look at some ways that kids can be activists. Now, some of these pictures we've already seen 
um, where we have some kids marching. Oh, I see somebody else said they could also make a speech. Yeah, you can give a speech um, as a way to, to take action. Here's some people with signs. We even have a boy that has a Black Lives Matter um, written across a piece of tape over his mouth. Um, that gave me an idea that maybe we could decorate masks. If we're out in public, we could put a message on our mask. Okay. So maybe you've heard of some children or youth that have been activists like uh, the environmental activist Greta Thunberg or Malala who has fought for education for girls. But I'm gonna tell you about some people that maybe you haven't heard of before. Um, I've got three people I'd like to share with you. And the first one is Sage Grace Dolan Sandriano. She um, was only 13 years old when she came out as transgender and she became an activist because her middle school administration didn't support her transition. So what she did is invited the human rights campaign to come to her school and speak with the administrators so that future students that were in the LGBTQ plus community and people like her would find more support. And by the time she was 16 years old, she became a writer and she published many stories in Teen Vogue about gender identity. And she continues to advocate for transgender rights through various means. The next person is Isra Hersey. She, was, she started attending um, protests with her mother when she was only six years old. She um, was 12 years old and in middle school when she started supporting Black Lives Matter. And um, when she was in high school though, she kind of changed her focus to more um, uh, issues related to climate change and how it affected black, brown and indigenous and low income communities. She founded a nonprofit called the Youth Climate Strike, which was led by many young people and they have led marches. In fact, she led one of the um, largest marches focusing on climate change ever. And then the last one is Marley Diaz. She was 11 years old and in school and, and she complained to her mom that all the books they were reading in school were about white boys and dogs. So she didn't like that. So she decided to, um, to try to get more books for, uh, that had black characters like her um, she decided with her friends to launch a campaign to raise some books that they were going to donate to a school in Jamaica. They started the A Thousand Black Girl Books campaign and they ended up raising over 9,000 books featuring black girls as the main character. So that's pretty amazing. Um, she called attention to the public for more diverse, for the need for more diverse representation um, in, in children's literature. So she did a great job. So now we're going to look at the many different ways to be an activist. We've talked about some of those already. Um, but one way is by making a sign, going to protest. Um, we talked about writing poetry. Um, you can also post things on social media. You can teach your classmates or start a letter campaign. There's many, many ways, but we're going to focus on making a sign or a poster. Um, so we'll go to the next. And here's just some examples of some slogans and symbols. So when you make a sign or poster um, that you want to share your message, um, you want it to be a very kind of simple and straightforward slogan, just a short phrase, phrase that communicates your message. Um, but it doesn't have to be words either. It could just be a symbol. Um, for example, um, I made a, a peace sign here. So you might just have a peace sign, um, but you can write your message out. Here's another example I did, quality education for all. Um, so once you get your idea though, um, then you're going to uh, do something with it, right? You can either march in a, in a march with it, or you could even um, post it in your window above your house or your apartment. Um, those, are, those are some things you can do. So now we're going to create our own poster. Basically, all you need is something to write on. It can be a piece of paper, cardboard, anything. Even the other side of wrapping paper. Um, and then you need something to write with. Markers, crayons, pencils, paint, whatever you want. You can use stickers to decorate it. 
And then if you want to make it a sign, you can use a paint stick or a popsicle stick or even a paper towel tube to hold it up. Or like I said, you can just tape it into your window. You can even make a sign if you're doing a march and you don't want to carry it. You can punch some holes in it, add some string and make it a sign that you can wear. These are all different things you can do. And we would really love to see what you could come up with. Um, so you can post it on social media and tag us at hashtag MHS learn because we would love to see um, the creativity that you can come up with. So now I'm going to turn it back over to Sarah, who's going to wrap up our workshop. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming today um, and participating. I heard so many great thoughts, so many great ideas, and we um, want to continue these conversations. So uh, check our website. We've recorded all of our programs relating to this uh, series that you can check out. Um, so please go to our website and our YouTube. Um, we are going to have on a um, on a meeting style of Zoom, we are going to all meet. If you want to stop in and ask us some questions, um, parents can ask questions, um, students can ask questions, whoever. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and put that in the chat right now. So that's if you want to join us afterwards. And then finally, um, we just want to say thank you again. Please keep checking back for more programs on this. This will not be the last. This is not the end of this conversation. Please check out our YouTube page. And also, we will be creating a um, resource guide, a kind of a care package that will be going out in September. So please keep checking back for our website. Thank you once again. I'm going to hang out here for people who might want to jump on the link. And for the rest of you, we'll see you over there. So thanks once again. And thank you for all of our educators for attending.